all the states have been doing on using sigma to support theory of mind in multi-agent interactions. And if you look at sort of the overall picture of what has been done in sigma, we're sort of covering a couple bullets here. We're talking about theory of mind, and in this previous implementation of theory of mind in sigma, we're going to use models of other agents in combination with reinforcement learning to update those models through the course of an interaction. And so this is, we are not, obviously, if you've been in the tutorial, you have an understanding of the sigma architecture. This talk is going to be at the level of basically the graph. So how we use the graph to some, for the agent to make decisions, as well as using the, uh, uh, changing the functions in the graph to learn mo better models of the other agent that can improve our decisions. And let me talk about a cycle in terms of the uh, in terms of it displaying it through the graph. But there are obviously conditionals and predicates that are used to realize it. But for the purposes of this much shorter talk, I'm going to be talking at the graph level to give you sort of insight into the kind of flavors of theory mind that we're doing. And so, again, this, we're looking at adaptive theory of mind, so we're going to look at how an agent is going to learn to interact in an environment. And so we look at reinforcement learning in general, and from a graph point of view, you have some states of the world that are evolving in response to an operator selected by an agent. And then after the, performing the operator or multiple operators, the agent gets some reward. And so the problem facing the agent is, how do I choose my operators to maximize my expected reward? And so, in this case, we're going to be looking at like a negotiation domain um, where we know what the transition is. So if I make an offer, I know that that offer has been made. And if I we accept the offer, then I get the allocation. And that's, that's all deterministic. And the, the agents are going to have known reward functions. So they know what, if we're, they're negotiating over apples and oranges, they know how much apples and oranges are worth to them. But the learning comes in because the agent has to understand not just the immediate effect of its actions and the, and the immediate payoff of those outcomes, but also uh, the long-term expected rewards for all this operator selection. And to do that, we're going to use uh, basically a form of reinforcement learning where you, you, you acquire Q values for your operators. So over time in interaction, you have to learn a Q function that tells you how valuable the expected particular operator selection to be in the, in the expected reward case. And you're, you'll use that to guide your operator selection, and you'll continue to refine it as you get feedback from the environment. And the feedback from the environment you can accumulate in terms of sort of projected value function over the particular state. So as you encounter states and rewards and make selections, you'll update um, your, your, your model projected value of the particular states. So you take your seat, reward signal, feedback, uh, feedback of the transitions that you're observing, the actions you're performing, and gradually your value function will approach the real expected reward. And once you have that, you can actually use the projected value as the basis for your Q function, where you'll see, well, the value, the expected value of an action is the expected value of the states I will project myself to be in after ch choosing that action. So that's a very high level view of reinforcement learning, but that should be sufficient for to get the different kinds of reinforcement learning we'll show in our different flavors of theory of mind. And when we exhibit this in a very abstract negotiation domain, again, we have two agents, A and B, negotiating over fruit, apples and oranges. Uh, for the purposes here, we're, we're, we're looking at one agent A trying to learn against another agent B that doesn't do any learning. So we're more interested here in how can we actually realize different uh, flavors of multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, but we're giving the agent a fixed target in this case. And so basically, just as far as the mechanics of the negotiation, they're taking turns, alternating, making offers. At any point, um, and one agent can accept what's on the table, and the negotiation terminates. They get the allocation as currently specified from the last uh, set of offers. And they each have their own individual reward function. They each know what their reward function is. And so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward negotiation. What, we're, again, we're looking at here is how can we play with the different ways the agents model, in particular, how agent A models agent B, and the kinds of learning that can happen and the kind of theory of mind that can result in them, all based on the same kind of same agent architecture of sigma. So if, again, if you look at the reinforcement learning model for agent A here, it's choosing its operator, uh, again, whether it's going to ch you know, change how many apples it's going to get, it's going to offer more apples to be, or offer fewer oranges to be. Um, it's going to, and, it, and it can actually go ahead, this is deterministic, it knows that it makes that offer, it's going to change the allocation on the table. If it knows that it accepts the offer, it's going to get that allocation, it's going to get the reward. So the, the one step, the, the one step transition is perfectly known to the agent, and really, this from all that was there, it could actually just use some, a, an MVP kind of algorithm to solve for the policy, it wouldn't have to do any learning. But of course, this is a multi-agent problem, and the challenge that in the, when you go to the multi-agent case is that now you have operator B's turn. So we have the same graph from the previous slide on the left-hand side, 
But when it's ADP's turn, we have a similar looking graph, um, but there's one key distinction in that the operator selection here, and so this is we're using influence diagram notation here, operator B is no longer a decision node for agent A. So it's, it's something that happens sort of exogenously to agent A's decision making, but it does affect agent A's reward. And, it, and so the question here is when agent A is trying to learn how to make its own operator selection, it needs to actually also learn something about the expected transitions from agent, that are going to occur because of agent B's decisions and how that's going to affect its reward. Okay. So the, not surprisingly, the, the first, one of the earliest approaches to the solving this problem from a multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, approach was to simply say, well, why don't we just not do anything? And say, we'll have no model of the other agent. Basically, we treat the agent as part of the environmental dynamics. Okay, so this was work done by Michael Littman and some other students afterwards. This is like happened, this is about 20 years ago. And so, from an influence diagram, you can see how this is sort of, uh, we basically, there's, there's a variable, the operator B, that affects the transition that happens, but we don't actually model anything about the process by which that operator is selected. And so this is the first approach to multi-agent reinforcement learning we did in Sigma. Um, so basically, we have a transition here, and we have a reward function, a reward signal that's, gained, that's observed by the agent A, and it can do, uh, again, reinforcement learning by doing gradient descent on this link where it backs up the reward to the projected value for the observed state, and then it can, again, do gradient descent here to, to learn uh, the Q function based on those projected, uh, projected values. And when it's agent B's turn, it does a similar backup, um, but here it's just sort of an exogenous transition. So there's no, it's not learning anything about uh, agent B, but it's doing the exact same backup where it observes the state transition, of the, it computes the node of the reward, and it can back that up into a probability of the state. And so what ends up happening here is that through gradient set based reinforcement learning in sigma, the a agent A is going to acquire state values on a value function over states that are based not only on uh, what the current offer is on the table, but whose turn it is. So when it's, its, when it's its turn, it knows that it can actually choose the operator to make the transition. And when it's agent B's turn, it, it le it's learning that there's, there's, there's going to be a state transition, but it doesn't have any control over it. Okay, so this, this allows the agent to learn Q values even in the face of a, another agent, who's B, but this is without any model of that other agent. So basically it's treating the agent B as part of the furniture in the room. It doesn't actually try to actually and model it as an agent in any way. And so the, the next question is, well, how can we actually add some, a model construct to this graph? And so one of the earlier attempts to actually extend the model here of the, of the other agent was, to, well, let's add a model of a policy. So we know that this agent is following some sort of behavior. It's choosing actions. It's not just part of the environment, it's actually a decision-making entity. And, it's make, and one of the simplest models we can use is to model it as following a stationary policy. So it's choosing actions with some probability as a function of the current state. And so from a, if you want to look at it from a game theory point of view, instead it's sort of like fictitious play, um, in that we have, we're modeling the agent as acting, agent B as choosing its offers and acceptances as, as a function of the current state, but with some probability. And so this is, the, the, the learning problem when we implement this in Sigma is actually not too different. You're still backing, you're still backing up um, the rewards you're observing to your projected values, but you're also now taking information you get when you observe agent B's actions, and you're, you're using great intent here to learn an action probability. Uh, so again, you're doing re reinforcement learning of, well, you're sort of acquiring a model of the agent's other agent's policy through the frequency count and gradient descent update that probability. And then you can use this, the, the model you're using here to inform this backup. So when you're actually backing up the, the projected value of the state transition, you can now weight it by the po policy model you have. So whenever you get an observation of operator V, you can update, um, you can weight the, the update to your value function by the likelihood you ascribe to that action. So if you've learned a good model of agent B's policy action probabilities, you don't actually, you're not going to you will weight observations that you think are unlikely less than actions you think are unlikely. So it's, it's a, a slight modification to the previous uh, slide where we don't actually have any, 
in this case, um, operator, operation operator B are not actually informing any of the learning. It's all based on the state transitions we observe. Here we extended to Adam a model of the policy, and we used that policy model to inform the learning that happened. Um, but this is not really theory of mind. Okay, oops. Um, this is really just a model of a, a random actor. And we, don't have no we have a policy model, but we don't have any model of how that policy is actually generated. So, and this is an observation also, also in, the, in the agents field, and so uh, one approach to creating a, a model of how the policy is generated that actually captures some of the agent decision making that's generating that behavior is to model the agent as maximizing some reward function, just as the reinforcement that agent A is looking at maximizing reward function, while well, we can model agent B as also doing the same. And so we can sort of expand the, uh, the policy node into a, a, a model of the process by which that agent is generating its policy. And we do that by modeling agent B as a reinforcement learner just as agent A is, but we don't know what reward function it's trying to maximize. And so we, we posit a space of possible models, a candidate set of possible reward functions, and we, we're going to basically model agent B. So again, this is similar to the graph that agent A has, but now we're all talking about agent B's value function. And agent B's value function as a, as a function of this model, where we, we can back up observations of the operator into uh, probabilities of a model, given, again, we're doing learning of value functions based on, again, as a function of which model we're looking at, and into back up into two functions, to gradient descent, to understand a prob posterior probability of which model it is. So, you know, we, we have maybe in, the, in our example, we have two possible models of agent B. Either agent B is someone who wants to give a very cooperative agent who wants to reach the same allocation as agent A, or a competitive one where there is some contention over some of the resources. And you can observe the behaviors, and by doing learning, you can learn Q functions for each of those two candidate models. And then by observing the behaviors, you, and you can do gradient descent to arrive at a posterior probability of which those models is more consistent with the behavior. So this is reinforcement learning by agent A when here, which, where it also then has a function of its belief about model, which B, model B is, it has, and then it makes its Q values and value function, it, it also becomes a function of which model it is. So agent A is doing reinforcement learning with a model of agent B is also doing reinforcement learning. And this, is, this has been a common approach in a lot of the uh, work on multi-agent systems where you have a positive can candidate model. And in game theory, you can have a model type, a set of types, um, but that's, we have a finite set here that we know ahead of time. Of course, we don't always know uh, this, this, this model space ahead of time. And so one of the questions is, well, well, if we don't know the model space ahead of time, can we get some, what else can we do? And one approach that's been used in the uh, literature is to do inverse reinforcement learning. So we know that agent B is doing reinforcement learning, but we may not know its reward function. Can we invert that process to actually understand what reward function agent B is maximizing based on its behavior? And in Sigma, we can do this exactly the same. It's, 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 it leverages the exact same gradient descent mechanism as we do for reinforcement learning to also do inverse reinforcement learning, where we, we observe operator B, and just as in the stationary policy model, we learn what policy, we sort of try to learn a policy that captures agent B's behavior. And then we can generalize that policy into a Q function because we can again posit that the actions that are more likely that we, we observe more often in a particular state are also the actions that agent B is going to ascribe more value to. And then because we know that there is a fixed reward function assigned to outputs of um, apples and oranges, we, can, we know the structure of the reward function and that allows us to generalize from the, the action probability into a Q function that is sensitive to the, to the reward function, which allows us to create a, a, a policy which is taken from the Q function that is consistent with the structure of reward that we know ahead of time. So we know the reward is some sort of linear function of apples and oranges in this case, and what we, we basically take the observed action probability and generalize it to a policy that is consistent with some point in that reward space. There were obviously more details in the paper, um, but the, again, what we've done here is we've taken, this is the, the sort of the fourth different variation on multi-agent reinforcement learning that we've taken from the literature and we've incorporated it uh, by putting, modifying the graph, the, the, the 
graph at the knowledge level and using the in inherent gradient descent mechanisms in the sigma architecture, we can get various combinations of reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning to realize various combinations of the possible multi-agent reinforcement learning in the theory of mind that we're targeting this negotiation domain. So there are more results on, on how this all plays out. Uh, oh, so yeah, so then, so then a, just in the stationary policy model, the, so the, the generalized policy that we get from the inverse reinforcement learning informs the A's own reinforcement learning. Now, when we use these methods, when targeting the fixed agent B, um, all four converge to optimal actually in roughly the same amount of time, which is actually kind of surprising. Again, there are more details about the particular accuracy in, in the paper. But I just wanted to comment on the sort of one of the places where they distinguish, distinguish themselves the most is actually in terms of their the runtime. You actually look at the messages that are here. So there's really not much difference between going from no model to a stationary model of the agent. And this is not too surprising because if you think about it, um, even when you go to a stationary policy model, you're modeling the agent as having a particular frequency of action, but you're not actually modeling any of its decision making. So there's really not that much more content to the model. When you go to this final the second two, where you actually introduce agent B as fault maximizing reward function, uh, there is a significant increase here in the complexity of the reasoning. Um, the IRL does not actually increase nearly as much as having the multiple models set. And, and so this is kind of an interesting way of actually doing the reinforcement learning combined with IRL to sort of arrive at a new way of doing multi agent decision making. Um, the reason the reward subset has so many more messages is that it's actually explicitly reasoning about multiple possibilities. So in the other three, where there's no model, a stationary policy model, and the IRL, uh, agent A, at any one point in time, has only one model of agent B. So it's, it's doing inverse reinforcement learning to arrive at a best candidate reward function model B. Uh, the reward subset model is keeping track of multiple possibilities and hypotheses about B, and so the messages are, much, are, are longer because of that additional space. But it does give it more flexibility in that it can, re it can reason about, explicitly reason about the uncertainty it has about agent B's reward function. Whereas the IRL is accurately getting a model of agent B's reward function, but it uses the best model at any point in time. So in conclusion, so we've been able to sort of take sort of four, four different ways of doing multi agent reinforcement learning. And really, by realizing within the Sigma architecture, simply by changing the knowledge level of it, knows them, introducing knowledge predicates to capture a particular modeling aspect, but using, using the exact same uh, graph arc gradient descent mechanisms to do the reinforcement learning, inverse reinforcement learning for both agents in a very interesting way. And it's actually not future work, it's actually present work that's going on right now. Uh, you want to actually experiment with these, com these different flavors of multi agent reinforcement learning in combination so that we can actually understand the more differential aspects among them. Uh, right now, the agent B is such a fixed target, it doesn't make, it doesn't make much difference which way he's. All, of them, all four are capable of getting the optimal behavior, but we want to actually make it a little harder on them by having the agent B learn as well and understand the sort of dynamics of those interactions. And I'll stop there, thanks.